best distilled creativity perspective advice on taking the journey through life. The journey of exploration into our creativity revealed a variety of topics and concepts that if better understood could greatly enhance our creative power and creative ability and improve the quality of our life. Additionally, I had observed and compiled a variety of wonderful, useful, and interesting pieces of information. Many of these are addressed in some way in varying detail in the Releasing Unlimited Creativity material posted on the web or on YouTube. However, I received an unexpected challenge. My challenge was to provide a young man with some simple guidance about life. Question was, is there a distillation to all that I had learned and I could give him? I had a lot of good information I could provide him, but much of it cannot be communicated simply and quickly. As I was sitting and reflecting on all that I experienced and learned about life itself and having explored our creative ability and creative power most of my life, I asked myself, what is the simplest advice I could give another? So I challenged myself. I asked, what is the best distilled advice I could give an individual about moving through life and their creativity and its application in their life to create what I would call a fulfilling life or a life worth living? In contemplating this question, I realized there were two recommendations. The first centered around an intention I set almost 60 years earlier at age 16 when I felt much of what I was being asked to learn in school seemed so limited in its usefulness. I told myself I wanted to learn things that went beyond the limited information I was being asked to learn. In some ways, I did not want to clutter my mind with limited, if not useless, information for my life or spend a lot of time learning things of little use. The intention I set was that I only wanted to learn that which was timeless and I could take from place to place wherever I went. At the time, I felt that for which I was asking were just simply the basic principles and concepts necessary for life rather than the information I was learning that seemed so limited in its application to a particular time and place. My feeling was I needed to continually look and seek out that which I felt was most basic and fundamental. I found many such concepts and principles for a variety of areas of life, but they all are not easily shared without some background. In reflecting, I realized I had the basic, timeless, fundamental understanding all my life, but I did not realize that it was timeless information, nor did I realize its importance. In fact, I was born with it and we all have it. I spent my life using it, but I was always looking in the wrong direction for that timeless information to understand it. I was too programmed and enculturated into listening to others. I kept following the directions of outside authorities or knowledgeable individuals as to where to look. I was never taught or told to look inward. Later in life, when I was told to look inward in meditation, it too was in the wrong direction. Meditation was not the answer, for meditation is about the mind, and I did not address the feeling. Again, I was misled by an external authority who presumed they knew what served me as a unique individual. In reflection, I found I was blessed by having the awareness of an inner feeling of inner satisfaction, the awareness of a feeling, a particular feeling. From the earliest age, I did not understand the concept of internal satisfaction and what internally satisfying really meant. It was just something I followed. I nevertheless was intuitively using it all my life from the earliest days of my life. As a child, I would say I sought to follow what was fun, but even then I understood the concept of fun was inadequate. There were many things that I did that were fun, but then there were some things that were very internally satisfying. The feeling of inner satisfaction of a certain experience went well beyond the experience. In time, I began to see this feeling as an internal compass that was guiding my life, and this feeling was timeless and available everywhere I went. I could trust this feeling of inner satisfaction to determine if I was going in the correct direction of life and it led me to what I needed by maintaining an awareness of it and the direction it provided. If I was receiving no internal satisfaction, I looked within and asked why. If I needed an answer or information, I would go within and focus on that particular feeling and ask what I needed to do. I realized no one or nothing gave me inner satisfaction. Rather, it was my response to life, but I found there were activities in life that allowed me to be in the state of internal satisfaction automatically. In time, I came to understand these activities were about what I incarnated to do, and this feeling was guiding me to these activities. What I eventually came to understand, we have a view of the mind and a view from what I would call the heart. 
The view of the mind was more about surviving in the world and doing what was asked by the world. The heart was what gave life and passion to engage life. I only needed to follow this feeling which arose around my heart and stay in alignment with the feeling. The guidance from the heart was more important than what mine wanted. I learned what served me and did not serve me by learning to align with this feeling. The journey of exploration of our creativity revealed we each need to learn to follow our own internal guidance, our own internal compass. So the first thing I recommend to anyone is to be open to feeling and follow your internal compass. We are capable of discerning our personal truth to know what serves us and does not serve us and our uniqueness. It's about learning to follow the feeling of inner satisfaction to guide our life and trust it will lead to where we need to be. Exactly what this feeling feels like to you is unique to who you are. The second recommendation took years to properly understand. It's about the mind but not what the mind knows. Rather it is to understand that we all carry within us in our mind is a creative imagination and we need to learn to hold our creativity sacred. To hold our creativity sacred is simply to look at where and why we do not allow ourselves to explore and pursue possible options, especially in our own mind. It's not about how much we know about life. Rather, it's how we respond to life both in the moment and long term. It is to know anything we plan is only the best option we see in that moment and it is subject to change. Our creative imagination is much more important than most realize. Our creativity and our creative imagination underlies all that we do and all that we are. Our creative imagination is much more than coming up with new ideas, fantasies, drawings, writings, and the like. Rather, every experience we have, we use our creative imagination to give us an understanding or an interpretation of what we experience. How we interpret what we experience is vitally important and we need to be allowed within ourselves to explore. We need to be willing to take the best options we perceive in that moment and understand why we perceive it as the best option. It's about using our creative imagination to move past just blindly responding to life. Our creative imagination is our greatest and most powerful asset. As to why it's our greatest and most powerful asset is that it needs to be realized that everything that exists that has not been created by what humans would call God and not created by nature started as a single thought in the mind of a single individual. Everything goes back to a unique perception an individual had of themselves and of creation. It does not matter what it is. Anything created by a human goes back to a single thought and experience of one person giving rise to that thought and that thought residing in the unfoldment in the creation that was developed by humans. To say a single thought can change the world is not an understatement. A single thought of a human mind has changed the world repeatedly and it needs to be noted that a single thought arose from that very unique and subjective perception of creation. Others may have bought into that thought and changed the world because it appeared to work for them. Nonetheless, it all started from a single thought within one individual's subjective perception. It needs to be understood we each are incredibly unique and all that we experience is subjective. No one sees and experiences creation as we do. No one has our pain. No one has our joy. It is our creative imagination that allows our unique perception to be integrated both with the reality of creation and with others in our life. It gives us the ability to change the way we think and perceive ourselves and our experiences and compare with what others have seen and experienced. It gives us the ability to adjust what we think and believe. Here it is vital that we learn to discern what's true for us and what serves our own being. Our creative imagination gives us the ability to create our way out of any situation we face in life if we learn how to explore a true creative endeavor. That is, a truly creative endeavor is an endeavor or creation never previously seen or experienced. Such an endeavor, mind is of little value for it has no memory or experience to understand what is being experienced and we need to learn to feel our way and follow our intuitive guidance that we receive as to how to proceed. Everything we experience arises from a flow of energy. In any given situation we face, if we are mindful and aware and open to feeling, we can discern and feel the flow of energy given rise to the experience we have and the thoughts it generates. Then we can feel what we think and see if it serves us by looking to see if it aligns with our feeling of inner satisfaction. 
However, mind is usually too preoccupied to focus in what we are feeling, to feel the energy that gives rise to the thought, or to check to see if the thought is really serving us or simply neutral. Yet, mind can learn to recognize differences between flows of energy, and it can be said each flow of energy has an energy signature, and we can discern which will serve us. What needs to be understood here is that all thoughts arise from an energy that is characterized by our mind. This includes the thoughts, conceptions, ideas, images, or whatever we experience in our mind. However, thoughts in our creative imagination arising from any flow of energy will have two parts. It has a real part and an imaginary part. The real part is the flow of energy that gives rise to the experience we have, and it is what we feel in the experience. The feeling is real. The imaginary part is our interpretation of the experience of that flow of energy through the illusion of mind. The illusion of mind is that our mind uses all that is within itself without thinking of how it will characterize the energy. It appears to look at all the information it has and looks for the best fit to match up the energy and its experiences. The more the energy is different than anything it has previously experienced, the greater the inaccuracies in the characterization. The more it is the same, the better the characterization. There is also the issue if the characterization of the energy is based on inaccurate information in the person's mind, then the interpretation is incorrect. But the illusion aspects is more about the options and how the energy is characterized. This takes us back and asks, do we have the freedom to explore options as to how we are interpreting what we are perceiving? Quite simply, it's about asking, is there another way to interpret what I am perceiving? A simple example of this is the signal we get from our eyes to our brain when we see the sun rise above the horizon and then set below the horizon. It is a real experience. We can measure the signal and it's real. Based on the interpretation of what we see, we say that it is true, the sun rises and sets. Unfortunately, the sun does not rise or set, the earth rotates. The belief of the sun rising and setting is an illusion and not real. Yet the illusion serves us well up to a point, and that point depends on what we wish to experience. This is one reason why individuals look to external experiences and phenomena to verify what they see is real, especially if others can agree with us about the external experience. Yet there is often still an interpretation which can be incorrect. The recommendation I leave you with is something I advised my son when I was teaching him how to play the clarinet and hopefully motivate him to practice. I said you should practice three ways. One way is practice to give the director or your audience what it wants. The second way is you practice to improve your technique and the ability on the instrument. The third way is probably the most important. It is the practice which you love to play, for it will give you the energy to do the other two. So too life. We need to give the world what it asks of us for the time and place we exist and we find ourselves. Then we need to practice our technique to engage life and are we willing and able to follow our own internal guidance? Do we hold our creativity sacred and give ourselves what we need in life? The third is to do something we love to do and allows us to feel that life is worth living for it will energize the other two. Often that is doing what makes us feel alive with the greatest feeling of inner satisfaction. So the best advice I can give about the journey in life is to learn to discern what is true for you. Follow your feeling of inner satisfaction, whatever it feels like for you personally. Hold your creativity sacred and allow yourself to have the freedom to explore options, at least in your own mind. Pay attention to how you are interpreting what you are experiencing and perceiving, for it is through your creativity you can create your way out of any situation in which you find yourself.